Wow. I, I confessed this week. I say confession is good. Uh, do you like to do that? I confessed. Uh, some of the content you're going to hear this morning is original, so to speak, comes, comes from him through uh, direction f- through us. I have to admit, and I will cheerfully c- admit, some of the content Sandra Womack's. All right? You will allow me that this morning. All right? Uh, also, it is the Word. And uh, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's all original content. That truly is. Last week, we had a question. It was a valid question. Uh, a poor explanation, perhaps, or a limited one at best. So, as I was waiting on the Lord, he just said words to the effect. Uh, question and answers, volume one. Now, you say you go be more volumes. I don't know. We have a document in front of us this morning, and we're going to deal with that. And I'm not going to get out there and look you in the eye, I don't think. Uh, that could be subject to change at any moment. But I want to I wanna sit here this morning, kind of sit here and share with you uh, some things. Uh, the, the question that was asked me last week was about the blind man. I'll give you that up front. And who did sin? The disciples asked Jesus, his parents, or him. Jesus said neither. But that the works of God should be manifest. And with that then uh, comes thoughts uh, of who did it, why it was done, and that sort of thing. It's to that end, we're going to gear some of our comments. And there was not a, a surprising question. I had it myself about 45 years ago. I keep saying this. 40 something, is that what it's like, John? It's, it's back there somewhere? About 45 years ago, in a stone house outside of Dwajak, Michigan, I sat on the stairway one night looking for an answer to that same question. Now, I knew last week that my answer came from 1 John. I didn't know what chapter and verse. Okay? We're going to get to it today. It's going to appear again. So, with that in mind, I think we also need to draw uh, some guidelines here or or some reasons for why I'm going to make the comments all based on the Word of God. Uh, Biblical questions and biblical answers, I need, they need to come from the Bible. Simple as that. Human reason, human logic, is the measurement of futility in the spiritual arena. Futility. Serving no useful purpose, completely ineffective, simple failure to achieve the desired result, long effort ending with severe disappointment. Why is that? Because the Holy Spirit is our guide into all truth. There is the key. He has all the right answers. So human reason, human reason, human logic are the only measurement in the arena of the world. Why is this true? In an unrenewed mind, the mind unaffected by the Word of God and the Holy Spirit cannot share nor prove what it does not know. You wonder how come you get so, so many strange answers from the people of the world, because they don't know. Not strange to them, it's reason, logic, and we gotta protect ourselves that that reason and logic don't overflow and affect us. All right? So, uh, the scripture says in Romans 12, 2, be transformed, that's a metamorphosis, by the way, transfigured by the renewing of your mind or the renovation. Uh, if you flip houses, you renovate them. Right. Change them inside, outside. Same thing is true. The word of God is to renovate our mind. That we may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. The will of God, the good pleasure of God. Sometimes you think of will as a negative thing when it talks about the will. Don't do that. If you take that will, 2307 is Strong's number for it, and track it out. Down the bottom, it'll say good pleasure. 
Uh, Revelations uh, talks about the good pleasure. I believe the will of God is your good pleasure. Okay? So, with that in mind, we are then the, the, the perfect will of God or the complete will of God for us. Now, Lynn, do you live in the complete? I trust for today. Tomorrow, it may be a, a different issue. You say, well, how, how can that be? I'm going to break your heart. Probably not. You know, I don't understand all truth. Not yet. I don't. My whole being must be geared to when, I, when the Spirit of God leads me into more truth, that I must be willing to change to conform to the truth He's shown me. That is the root, and that is the cure for our lives. Amen. Being willing to change. Yeah. Oh boy. And sometimes people, I look forward to it generally in anticipation. You know, it's just, show me more. Matthew 7, 7 and 8 says this. Ask or crave. <laughs> Require. Oh boy. Require. Ask, crave, require, and it shall be given you. Can I ask, crave, and require from him? Yeah, you can. He's more than glad to show you truth. More than willing to get it done. Be a willing receptacle. Ask, and it shall be given. Seek, pursue, and ye shall find. Knock, it shall be opened unto you. Notice, these are all shells. The strongest English af words of affirmation in the dictionary you can find amongst our, our language. He shall, he shall, he shall. For everyone, you say, I'm a sect. No, you are not an exception. For everyone that asketh, receives. Amen. And he that seeketh, findeth. To him that knocketh, it shall be opened. As a father would give, would you give your son a stone when he requests bread? As a father, would you give your son a serpent when he requests a fish? That's in verses 9 and 10. No, you wouldn't do it. I, I read something the other day, and uh, this would be an A.W. story. A friend of his said, when I carry my daughter, she does not have fear. I'm carrying her. When it comes lunchtime, she knows she'll not go away hungry. I'll feed her. It's not based on, on all her actions. It is based on the fact that I'm her father. Amen. See, all these things are based on the fact that we have a heavenly father. We have a Savior who only acted and only did as the Father, as he seen the Father do. Would that we function that way? The answer is, we would, we would give him bread, we would give him a fish, we'd not give him a stone, we'd not give him a serpent. The answer is absolute, absolutely not, and verse 11 says, much more shall your heavenly Father give good things to them that ask him. Much more. Amen. Much more. Uh, I get acquaintance. I just, I, I, I continually ask that he will live in abundance overflowing. And it's, from what I can see, the only way that ever can be is if God does it for him. But then again, that's how you and I do. Some of us have been in those times where groceries was slim, next door to none. And they were provided. Some people never, may perhaps never know that. Hmm. So biblical questions need to be answered by the Bible, not human reason and logic. It'll get there, but you first start with the truth as the Spirit of God reveals it to us. I've had questions. You've had questions. I've had wonderments. You've had wonderments. 
Simple as that. Wonderment. Webster defines it as one, exciting admiration and wonder. Two, astonishment, surprise, curiosity about something. Three, a marvelous act or work or accomplishment. You ever had a wonderment? Mm -hmm. The wonderment is, has its birth in wonder. <laughs> Isn't that something? One, perhaps a miracle, a marvel, a word, captures and maintains your rapt attention, but remains awesomely mysterious or new to your experience, perhaps leaving you with a feeling of doubt and uncertainty. Been there? Yeah. Two, arousing your curiosity, sensing this is beyond anything previously known, certainly not anticipated. Your inquiry begins, your seeking answers. Inquiring, inquiry and answers, when satisfied by revelation of the word, by the Holy Spirit, may require compliance for maximum benefit. <laughs> Don't you like that? I, I, yeah. That's, that's, I'll go. It will require. Okay? So the first question today was asked last Sunday. I'll paraphrase the question again. The man born blind was not blind due to the sin of parents, or the, nor the blind man, but the works of God should be made manifest in him. I'll read you then uh, the question basically, as I interpret it today, was he born blind for a divine purpose? Did God set him up? Did God cause the blindness? Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to read John 9, first seven verses, and then we're going to come back and take those verse by verse, basically. Now, Jesus in the eighth chapter of John has just got through talking to the, uh, to the Pharisees, and he... You ever notice Jesus could get particularly blunt to the church? The church of the day, the, the Pharisee. They tried to, they was going to kill him. He says, you, you're, you're of your father the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning. You want to kill me? You're functioning for him. He said, and then he goes down and he comes right back at him and says, uh, your father is the father of all lies. I tell you guys, I would never on this world want to tell a lie. You might as well post a sign over your head. This thing originates with Satan, this lie. A little white one? A little green one? Hum humanity has this ability, inherent ability, to diminish. Whatever said. I sat in a Sunday school class, once teaching it, when this student said, uh, uh, I was drawing some correlation, it had something to do with um, the enemy and his activity, and she says, uh, said something to, what if it's not that bad, what if it's only a, a green thing? I said, green, what are you talking about? Green, well maybe only a white thing. I said, white? You know, come on. She says, well, this is what God does for me. I says, just a minute, just a minute. Slow this down for me. I says, let me ask you one simple question. When this happens to you, do you feel lifted up or depressed? And she just, depressed. I said, guess what side of the aisle that comes from? Jesus told these Pharisees, before Abraham your father, because they're confessing his Abraham seed, before your father Abraham I was. And besides, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And this just drove these Pharisees nuts. Can I use that word? Nuts. They got upset. They were setting out to stone him when verse 1 of chapter 9 opens up. And he was passing through them. I got, a, I got an idea that maybe the disciples were going through there too you know, undetected, because they're right there with him and said, look at this man. Here we go, verse 1. Now this, I will say this, Abraham died approximately 1,800 years before Jesus was walking here, all right? You can see why, you know, logic said this is impossible. Human reason was impossible. The Son of God said it was not, from his perspective in the spiritual realm. You see what happens? We don't get over on his side. All right, here we go. I, 
And the I am is passing through. Verse 1, And Jesus, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. His disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works uh, of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground, made clay of spittle, anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay, and he said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way. Now, you tell me how he did that. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. Neat, isn't it? Neat. So Jesus saw the blind man from birth. Verse 2 is the disciples' question. Master, who did sin? This man or his parents that he was born blind? Perhaps it was a common belief in that day. I don't know that, that, that it was caused by someone's sin. And I think in some measure you'd find this thinking pertinent today. Still alive. In this case, the parents and the son's sin was not the cause, yet it is true sin introduced sickness into the world. Yet Jesus did tell, yes, Jesus did tell the man who was healed at the pool of Bethsaida to sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you in John 5, 14. Yet we cannot always link sickness and a person with a person's individual sin. And that is the way Jesus ministered to this blind man in verse 3. Jesus answered, Neither has this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Well, hello. That sent him into a tizzy, so to speak. This then has led many people to interpret the rest of this verse as saying that God made this man blind just so he could heal him and be glorified somehow. Been there? Have you? That's the question. From this thinking, many doctrinal teachings has arisen about how sickness and other problems in our lives are actively, actually blessings from God, intended to bring glory to Him, to God, and correction to us. Let me just say, not so. Can I just say that? Yeah. Not so. Not so. Well, Lynn, what, how do you explain it? I'm going to explain it by this reasoning does not line up with other truths of God's Word. If we took this one, we're going to have to exempt certain other ones. All right? So we're going to go uh, to the blessing. We're not going there. I'm just going to recount it to you. If you have notes, you'll see where it's at. Uh, to the blessing of obedience in Deuteronomy uh, 1 through 13, basically, maybe 3 through 13. That's the blessing of obedience. From verses 15 through 68, that is 53 verses of curses. 53 of them. Of negative things. That is the result of disobedience in those days. Now, let's do this. So, now Deuteronomy 28 settles, for the, uh, settles forever the question of whether sickness, poverty, and oppression are really blessings in disguise. God said that sickness here throughout the, from 15 through the end of the chapter and poverty are curses, not blessings. Got that? It, that has remained unchanged from there to our day. Unchanged. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Uh, let me do this with you. Uh, Galatians 3 13 and 14. Christ hath redeemed us. We went from a covenant here to a covenant based in the life, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. That's what we went to. That's what we live in. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Why is that? Being made a curse. He was made a curse for us. He said, I have power to lay down my life, and I have power to take it again. Amen. This commandment have I received of my Father. And in laying it down, he knew the, uh, the agony, the, what he was bearing for you and I. He was our substitute. We need to understand. Jesus Christ is our substitute. 
Not only that, we are joint heirs in his blessing. We are children of God. We are sons of God. That's who we are. He's, call, he's, he's carrying us, so to speak. Amen. Amen. It's not his intention that we drop, fall, or move away. It's not his intention not to feed us. Not, it's not his intention to leave us hanging high and dry and doing some evil thing to us. That's not what he's, he's, he's not why he sent his son. Okay. It, uh, for his written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on the tree, that the blessings of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Will you give me a verse 29 to that, please, of chapter 3? I think it's the right one. We'll check it out. Galatians 3.29. Galatians 3.29. What is it? And if you be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Hey, that's simple enough. Uh, that is really quite direct. Thank you, Steph, if that was you. You'd prefer I didn't call your name that time. Wow, wow. So we join heirs with Jesus in Romans 8, 17, and on we, on we go. God's curses has been placed on Jesus, removed from those of us who accept Jesus' sacrifice. As a believer, I'm set free. As a believer on the cross, he might as well took in big letters and said, your debt's paid in full. Yeah, paid in full. Paid in full. Uh, years ago, one of the prophecy books I read uh, likened it to a prison when the, when, the, when the prisoner's time was up or somebody else paid his price, he got to walk out. Onto that cell door was attached a copy. And it basically said, when you put it down to the nitty gritty, he's out of here, his debt paid in full. We had one that paid our debt in full. Wow, that's good. That is good. Jesus also taught that a house divided against itself cannot stand. They accused him of casting out devils by, uh, devils by Beelzebub, the chief of, uh, prince of devils. And he said the house divided can't stand. He can't do that and have his house stand. Very simple. Acts 10.38. Ah. Boy. Brother Johnson, he was older when I was about 24, slow reader. He was reading one night in a, a Bible study type thing, and he read the 10th chapter of Acts. Well, I couldn't wait. You got the idea? I might tend to be a little bit in a hurry. I want to know what I want to know, okay? And so I read 10th chapter of Acts. I got the 38th verse, and that's the case where the tortoise passed the hare. Because I got hung up on the 38th verse, and this is what it said. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about healing all that was oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. What did Jesus do? He went about healing all who were oppressed of who? Well, how do you know if it's him? I know. How do you know? My book tells me. It, tell, it tells me in very explicit terms. Yes. Uh, whoa, let's just use John. Let's start out with John 5, 19. Verily, verily, surely, surely, I say unto you, truly, truly, I say unto you, that the Son cannot do uh, any, nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. We can only do what we see the Son do to what he saw the Father do. He lived his life on earth, and then he empowered us to live life on earth. Hello? You say, just a minute. 
And I wonder why I forgot this earlier. I knew it come through my mind. He just reminded me of it. Uh, John 8, 31 and 32, please. I had this problem. You say, Lynn, you couldn't have had every problem. Uh, no, I don't think I did. But I had multiples. Because, like I said, my folks were sh and my buddies were telling me, these things happen. Supernatural, positively, things happen according to Mark 16, which some Bibles don't even put in. Yeah. Ah, hello. So, all I could do was see the disciples doing this. But I was willing to learn. I learned in an upstairs floor, Henry Street, Muskegon, right off of Henry Street. I forget what the name of it was, in a two-story house. I was up there reading one day. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, I knew if the Jew had it, it was given to me. Hello. It, that's, I knew that. I didn't know the rest of this. But if you continue in my word, I can continue in your word. Then are you my what? Disciples indeed. I can live, function as a disciple lived and function. Huh? And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Amen. I'm not saying these words. See? The one, the one, the original sayer said them. Hey? Hey. Okay. Wow. Therefore, some sickness or infirmities happen, not as a direct re result of an individual sin, but as an indirect result of sin in general. Of course, this man and his parents had both sinned. You say, they had? Well, Romans, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but it wasn't due to their sin that this man was born blind. Okay. Jesus wasn't saying they were sinless, but simply that he wasn't anyone's individual sin that caused the blindness. Now, because of the wording of this word, verse, some have taught that God sovereignly made this man blind so he could heal him. But that would counter a very clear doctrine of the New Testament that says only good and perfect gifts come from above. And that's what it says. That's another one I come across. This is James 1.17. I go, whoop, whoop, whoop to do. Ever good gift. Is health good? Yep. Is, is being able to pay your bills good? good. Is, it, is it good to have some money left over? Yes, okay. And that's exactly what he's doing to us here. Ever good gift, ever perfect, complete gift is from above. Yes, in him. Neither he doesn't go out and set up shadows. Uh huh. Boy, I tell you, that's all right. Uh -huh. So, but he is going to redeem this situation with a blind man and bring glory to God in transforming him. You see, verse 4 of John 9 says this it is necessary, it is a necessity. He says, I must work. I must minister. The works of him that sent me, while it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. That day has not arrived at this point. Amen. So, there's a difference between work, as you see it in the first part, minister. Works is, it starts with the definitions, going back to the creation of God, of the earth. He called it works. Works. That's supernatural works, isn't it? Oh, and so on it goes. We are, we, he is, he do it. We remember the works of God and the wonders of God. Jesus, I do the works of my Father, he said. Wow. I'm, works is always an action. If you think God authored it, this concept generates inaction. You're sidelined. Jesus was saying it was the work, the ministry of God, to heal this man, and he must therefore do it. S sickness is the work of the devil, which was unleashed to the world through Adam's sin, while healing is the work of God. And you say, now prove that. I'm going to do this with you. I'm going to let you read it for yourself. 1 John 3, 8. This is my answer on the stairway, remember? 
This was my answer that night. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning for this purpose or this cause. This is the reason, this is the reason the Son of God was manifest, revealed, that he might destroy. My margin said, undo the works of the devil. You got a blind man. He said, I must work the works of my father. I must work these. What's he going to do? He's going to undo the works of the one that gave it to the man. You undo the works. That was his purpose. That was the cause. That was the reason he was here. Who gave it to him? The works of the devil. John 10.10. 10. I, I would remember this. Uh, it just The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Simple. Steal, kill, and destroy. Steal, kill, and destroy. I am coming you might have life and have it more abundantly. You've got, you got the contrast right there. John 17, 4. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou givest me to do. He says, I finished it. 1 Corinthians 3, 9. We are laborers together, co-laborers with God. We are God's husbandmen. We are his cultivated field. We are God's building. We are his architecture. Amen. Amen. Woo. Ephesians 2, 10. Listen, 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 listen. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. For what reason? Unto good works. What good works? The same ones Jesus did. Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Amazing, isn't it? Well, all right. He's prepared us, appointed us beforehand that we should walk and live in these good works. Verses 5 and 6. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground, made clay of spittle, anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay. The blind man hadn't taken any steps of faith towards Jesus. Remember the blind man that heard Jesus? He threw off his clothes and, I want to be healed, and made a move for him. What is he going to do? A blind man in a crowd going to find those clothes again? He didn't expect to come back blind. He expected God to transform, or Son of God, to transform him, and if he needed those clothes, he'd go find them. If not, he was equipped now to get others. We, there is acts of faith that goes along with our activity. All right? Wow. Oh, he was giving this guy something to do. There's reasons. His body was made of clay originally in Adam, just for the record. I'm not going to go there, though. Let's verse 7, and we'll complete this. And said unto him, the guy as he put clay was spit in his eyes. Now, wouldn't that be a trip? Some of you ladies might not like that. It wouldn't be like mascara, would it? it kind of thick and gooby, gobby. Okay. Gooby. This guy didn't say nothing. Jesus told him, go your way to the pool of Siloam, wash. And then when the guy, he went and washed. How he got there? He made it. Some say it's half a mile away. I don't know. But anyhow, he got there. There he is. And now he says, he washed and came seeing. Simple as that. You say, simple? Yeah. Well, who made this man blind? I would say the enemy. Why did he do the works of God? Because that was, his, that was Jesus' assignment. That assignment is still given to you and I. Where we find it, we're supposed to be setting the captives free. Now, there's reasons, and maybe we'll go there. Because if we get started on this, uh, we ought to know the reasons to, to minister more effectively. And perhaps we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Because uh, we want to be effective. We just don't want to spin out. All right. Wow. Amen. Father, we thank you. It's a word, and it remains unchanged to this day. We thank and praise you for it. It is ours. It's given to us, and you tell us what to do with it. We invest it in the kingdom of God. We thank and praise you for it. 
We do. Anybody want prayer this morning? We're going to have communion here in a moment. And uh, uh, Patty, will you get whoa, down the hall? Uh, everybody's welcome. Just consider you and your fellowship with him. Uh, and that reminds me, I got to get you something. It's all right, I get it to you for next week. All right. All right. Uh, I don't know. I need a part. Oh, we'll use we'll use them two guys sitting on the back. We'll use the in-laws. Can we have a little background music, please? <laughs> 